Now, is it, I really think it's necessary for us to start putting things like this together again because there's a lot of people out there that are trying to figure out what to do. People are out there in the streets, people are out there make, trying to make things happen, but we aren't getting the results that we're getting. We saw an Occupy thousands, millions upon millions of people around the world saying there is something wrong with the system that we have put together here. And all of a sudden, it just stopped. <laughs> and it can't stop, because it's gonna come back up again. And if Occupy happens again, it might get nasty. Yeah, and we wanna make sure that we have things stabilized and, and in, the right, in the right situations that we want them to be in, otherwise, uh, we're going to call, otherwise, we may tend to lose more than we gain. We don't need to do that. We have this, we, ha we are putting ourselves in um, bad positions when we let things go. We cannot do that this time. We saw when occupied the, um, the call, um, we saw the need, we saw people desperate for some change, and we just got to follow it up. And that's the truth of the matter on that one. Go in this. How many of y'all watch Bill Maher? All right. I mean, sometimes when, when he speaks, he's on. He's, and when he's on, he's on like a light switch. And, but when he's off, he's very off. I mean, let's not get into his discussion about Muslims. Um, but he brought up um, Occupy. Occupy has only been, um, an Occupy member has only been on this show once. Tea Party members have been on this show over and over and over and over and over again. But he says he's down with Occupy. All right, be a little bit more down. Instead of telling us what he um, told us in one of his new rules segments, uh, people in Occupy now have to get out of the tents and start canvassing for Democratic candidates. Oh, my. And I sat there, and I know I'm in the church, and I normally don't talk like this in the church, but I said, that's not a new rule. That's the same old shit. Yeah. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, we weren't looking for political satisfaction when we were out there. We were looking for economic satisfaction. We wanted, and that's how come they're talking about economic inequality today in yeah. the mainstream. Whether or not they'll do something about it, no. <laughs> we are going to do something about that. And, uh, and it's the only way um, they're going to get the message, it seems, is if we go out there in the streets and say, you will change. If you won't change, you, got, you have got to engage in a class struggle. Because the class struggle is what's going to make the difference. And they know that. And they will fight you hard, as we saw with Occupy. But the okay, other so thing is, she so said, and this is, and this is actually on our website because we use this in one of our headers. Um, Ida B. Wells said that the people must know before they can act, and there is no educator to compare with the press. They also hate the media a lot. Now I'm a writer. That's that's where, if you want to call it activism, that's where my activism is. I'm a writer. I've always wanted to be a writer. If you look, if you ask me when I was in the sixth grade what I wanted to be, I will tell you journalists. And in many respects, that's exactly what I became. I mean, in the course of my life, I have been a columnist for newspapers. I have been a reporter. And now I'm just a regular, um, more or less blogger, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And that's why One People's Project is so effective, because it's not so much about being um, engaging in propaganda. Propaganda is good every now and again, but sometimes you just got to have the facts laid out straight up without any nonsense, without any emotions going behind it, without any editorializing. And that's what I try to focus on. That's what me and my crew try to focus on. And that's one of the reasons why um, we have been particularly effective in our work. Even though a lot, of, uh, a lot of people in this room may not have heard of One People's Project, a lot of people on the right have. <coughs> And that's why they've been going after us like God knows what, um, you know, y'all. Because I go to right wing events all the time. I never get a chance to just chill with my folks and talk and see where everybody's at. But I'm always I'm always in the face of these right wingers. So I am. So I'm glad to be here. And um, I'll just tell you also that I'm going to be back here in about a month. Well, not in Memphis, but in Nashville, because the American Renaissance Conference is going to happen again. Is anybody familiar with American Renaissance? For those who don't know what American Renaissance is, American Renaissance is a publication that is produced by a board member of the White Supremacist Group Council of Conservative Citizens, um, who believes, as Southern Poverty Law Center will point out, 
that, among other things, that black people are a retrograde species of humanity. They believe in separation of the races. And one of their board members, by the way, is, is um, going to be broadcasting here in Memphis for his regular radio show called The Political Cesspool. His name is James Edwards. Um, and he's right up here in Miller at 9 o'clock at WRLM. And he does this every Saturday. Um, the American Renaissance slash Council of Conservative Citizens are very politically connected. They're very academically connected. Um, they have their money. Um, they, have, uh, they have a little bit of pull until someone exposes their members. And then all of a sudden, they're losing jobs. Um, this is exactly it. They, used to, they came out of the White Citizens Councils. And from the White Citizens Councils, um, they turned into the Citizens Councils of America, and then they became Council of Conservative Citizens. It's led by L. Gordon Baum, who was based out of uh, St. Louis. And so they've been around for a while. American Renaissance, like I said, is a publication. It's put together by a guy named Jared Taylor. Um, they don't actually do print anymore. Now this is everything um, web-based. And every other year, they would have conferences to bring all their politically connected white supremacists together. And they used to be on C-SPAN. They were so tight in with the system. So Council of Conservative Citizens, American Renaissance, their conferences were on C-SPAN all the time. And then um, people started asking, well, who are these people and why are they, um, and why are we giving them all this um, airtime and all this, and all of a sudden C-SPAN didn't show up. So in 2000, the first year that C-SPAN didn't so, um, show up, and they were, they were aching for um, some sort of uh, press to come see them. So a public access station, public access um, television show out of New Jersey came, went down there with a film crew and interviewed a number of people that attended. Uh, I was the producer, and <laughs> and I was the one that created that show. So I have a whole lot of video from inside the American Renaissance Conference, and it was some of that video that got a, a, a an associate of the American Renaissance fired from his job in the Bronx as a high school professor, as a high school um, principal at a Catholic school. He changed his name tried to become a high, uh, um, high school principal at another um, school in Erie, Pennsylvania. Then they found out what his real name was and they bounced him out earlier this year. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with these days. As a matter of fact, one of the things we talked, um, there was a lot of talk today about um, the prison system and how we get caught up in it. And I would tell you one of the other things that we need to concern ourselves with as well is the education system, whether it's in, in the public schools, or even in our universities. And there is going, the guy who, um, this political cesspool show, tonight is going to be talking about uh, former South Carolina Lieutenant Governor Glenn McConnell. He's supposed to be, um, become the next president for the College of Charleston, and a lot of people are upset about that because of his neo-confederacy that led him, among other things, to be on the political cesspool once. So they're going to be addressing that on his show today. My attitude about that is, if we want our kids to, <coughs> kids to get ahead in life, this is the last deal we want running our universities. So we really need to focus on that. We really need to focus on um, a lot of these individuals who are trying to angle themselves into positions of power. And that's why One People's Project is so effective, one, um, uh, so important. What I would say about us and um, what we have to do to fight fascism in the 21st century is notice in particular what it is that they are doing that's different than years past. You see, in years past, I mean, when One People's Project started in 2000, we were dealing with a lot of the street Nazis. I've been doing this for about 26 years now. And when I started, you saw a lot of your um, boneheads and you saw a lot of your um, folks that like to burn crosses and show up on Geraldo <coughs> or whatever, have the swastikas and all that, and, and just be out there full force because they still had the strength. But the reason why they still had that strength was simply because 
the people that remember Jim Crow, the good old days and all that, were still, were still running things, but now they're dying off. Now they're retiring. So now you have this generation that, have, that does not have that foundation anymore, but still wants to maintain those principles. Even though deep down inside, they really don't subscribe to them in some respects. But they still want to maintain the level of fascism in this country. But it doesn't go well. It doesn't, because um, everybody, for the most part, will reject them immediately. The Minuteman Project came along in 2005 and changed all of that. Whenever you're dealing with the immigration issue, these folks feel like it's their time to shine, and they will become a part of anything involving, um, involving the immigration campaign, and they'll be right up there in the front. All they have to do is say, I'm not racist. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they have to do. And once they realize that, then they said, okay, we'll start pulling back some of the rhetoric. Yeah, I love Hitler, but I don't have to tell them. <laughs> so you got, you got websites like Stormfront that bans the N-word. <laughs> you can't have swastikas anywhere on your website. Um, yeah, Confederate flags are nice. Make sure it's next to an American flag, too. Um, I mean, they basically just downplay all the hate mongering. That, well, not, they don't downplay the hate mongering. They downplay the, the triggers, the swastikas. The burning crosses. The Klan is not existent really in this day and age because the moment you say the Klan, okay, it's time to go away. The moment you say National Alliance, who's that? Council of Conservative Citizens? Oh, he's conservative just like Ann Coulter, who by the way supports them. <laughs> she gave him props in one of her books. Um, yeah, it's fine. American Renaissance? Sure, that sounds, that sounds benign enough. Never mind the fact that when you really want to talk about American Renaissance, you look at the cross section of this room. We are the American Renaissance and we in truth. <laughs> Nothing that they're trying to maintain is ever going to amount to a Renaissance. What we do, that's a different story. Okay. So, um, so you have these folks out there and they're trying to just un try to go under the radar. And they have been effective in some areas. Has anybody ever worked with ACORN? Yeah. Ba yeah, back in the day. Now, anybody familiar with how they got shut down? Yeah. yeah. With the guy that dressed up as a pimp and went into some offices and caught him on video saying things that they shouldn't have said as far as they're concerned. Dr. the video. They didn't do anything criminal as, um, as investigations later found out, but it was enough for those right-wing politicians in, in D.C to undercut their funding and that, and that put them down. Well, it, it, it caused ACORN to go out of business, but basically all the, um, they basically just broken off into separate groups and now they do the same work under different names. So let's just be real about that. They really didn't stop the work. Jobs, the justice. Yeah, I mean, when Jobs for Justice um, is, I don't know if they were connected to ACORN per se, but they, um, but that's a very good example. They are going out there and they're still doing the work because the work is more important than what Rush Limbaugh wants them to do. <laughs> so what happened a couple of years before that was that there was a conference that was a rather some sort of a forum similar to this that was um, put on by some of these white supremacists. They called themselves the Robert Taft Club. And James O'Keefe attended. Jared Taylor was one of the speakers. <laughs> so we got a picture of James O'Keefe, Jared Taylor's in the background. And we have that on in our brochures if you look. You can't see it in the picture because the, um, the resolution is bad. But you can see that um, James O'Keefe was at this particular conference. When we put this picture out after he had gotten arrested for trying to allegedly wiretap a, um, a senator's office, um, when we put the picture out, he was um, being... Um, his boss was a guy named Andrew Breitbart. And Breitbart lost his mind. He went on an eight hour Twitter um, rant, literally eight hours of Twitter rant, <coughs> trying to keep people from letting this story go any further. And the problem was, I mean, basically he had all his, um, he had all his, his ducks in a row. He had all his conservative bloggers just slamming um, other people. He didn't slam us um, because the thing is, they don't want to go after black activists directly. They know if they go after black activists directly, 
that we're just going to push back even harder. But they can go after everyone around us. So instead of going after one people's project, they went after uh, Salon, they went after Max Blumenthal, they went after the Village Voice, anybody else that put that, put that story out there. And they caused it to get shut down. But the story was still true, so the story was still out there. And what happened later is that we found out that O'Keefe was still hanging out with the same people, and we got pictures of that. On top of that, we got a picture of Andrew Breitbart posing with a neo-Nazi named Matthew Heinbach from you from Western Civilization, which was the group that came out of Robin A. Taft Club. Now, Heinbach is a full-on neo-Nazi. He's all over the place today, trying to start some sort of race war or whatever. Young kid out of Towson University. And everybody knows who Matthew Heinbach is. So we put that story out. Breitbart is dead now. Breitbart passed on about two some odd years ago. So, but his people were still around. And they kept their mouth shut. James O'Keefe won't even talk about this. Or he did in one of these documentaries. But the um, fact of the matter is, the less they talk, the more you know you got them. And that's how you, that's where you got to get them. That's the position you got to get them in. You have got to have as much information about these folks in, an effort, in order to shut them down. One of the things that we was able to do at American Renaissance Conference was we were able to get the press out there to interview some of the folks that were there. In 2006, they, we, um, they interviewed someone who uh, turned out to be a prosecutor upstate New York. They got him fired for attending that conference. In 2008, we had a massive bunch of people in Herndon, Virginia, when we had, um, and that was the first time we had a real big um, showing of people protesting this particular conference. In 2010, he tried to, um, American Renaissance was holding yet, a, trying to hold yet another conference, and we mobilized again to let the hotels know that this conference was going to happen. And they got shut down. They got shut out of four hotels in the D.C. area. So they just gave up and said, we will not have a conference this year. They tried again the following year, 2011. They tried it in Charlotte, North Carolina. We did the same thing. And this time, the local government um, started contacting the hotel. As a matter of fact, the mayor of Charlotte that just got indicted was, um, was responsible for letting the hotels know that this um, conference was going on. Remember, they was about to have the Democratic Convention the following year. No, they was going to have Democratic Convention that year. They couldn't have, uh, they couldn't have um, the rep that they hosted a uh, white power conference just a couple of months beforehand. So all the hotels just closed their doors to Jared Taylor again. And that's why they're in Nashville today. Because this is the only place that they could go, that they could find, that where they can be hosted and not have any problems. But we are still getting people fired from their jobs we go, um, for attending the thing. Um, we managed to get, uh, I found out that um, somebody was uh, working for the US military making non-lethal bombs. So we, put, we got him put on suspension. He's still there though. He got his job back. Other people have lost their jobs for going to the um, American Renaissance conferences. And once again, they're coming here for the third time this year. They're coming to Nashville. So we want to try to get people to come out to that. On top of that, the National Socialist Movement is going to be holding a conference in Knoxville the same weekend. It's going to be on the 26th, April 26th. So Tennessee is hopping. Tennessee is really hopping with this kind of activity. And we haven't even gotten to the anti-Muslim activity over in Murfreesboro that's going on these days. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on here. And it's all incumbent upon us learning everything we know about them to keep them from growing any further. Knowledge is the best way to take them down. So when we shut down the 2010 conference, um, there was a uh, guy pretending to be an Indian, Native American named David Eagley, who um, says he's, he said he was Comanche Indian, and he was one of the speakers. He's actually Italian. He's, he says he's Comanche, he traces his um, lineage to Bad Eagle. 
His stepmother was Comanche. He wasn't, but he claimed it anyway. So he decided two years ago that he was going to sue me and anybody else that was involved with the shutdown of American Renaissance 2010. But he didn't do it in D.C., he didn't do it in Virginia, he didn't do it in Pennsylvania where I live. He did it in Oklahoma where he lived. And they said in, in the literature and in the writings that they have um, put out that they did it because they wanted to go to a court that will be charitable to them. That doesn't work, it doesn't work that way. I mean, in fact, of the matter is you have to be in the, you have to file in the jurisdiction where the court, what, where the um, incident happened, where the tort happened, and they didn't do that. They, so I just basically ignored the, uh, the court case because I wasn't getting anything from the courts itself in the first place. I was getting letters from their, from Yeagley's lawyer and who, by the way, went to the 2010 American Renaissance Conference as well. <laughs> and earlier this year, they got a default judgment on me. They, according to this judgment in Oklahoma, I have to pay David Eagley $50,000. And I'm still laughing about it. <laughs> They're writing, saying they finally shut down one people's project and all that. There's been tons of le tons of articles and things, and somebody finally decided to talk to me about it back home, and I explained to them how much of a joke it really was, and until they bring until they bring the case into Pennsylvania, there's really nothing for me to do. And um, once they do bring it to Pennsylvania. I will shut it down because the fact of the matter is that they were they had no jurisdiction. And bottom line is, the the case was a joke anyway. He said that we called the hotels and threatened to commit violence and murder. That's actually in his um in his court papers. Um, now the point may be particularly moved because a couple of weeks ago David Eagley died. <laughs> We deal with um, we deal with a lot of international because some of the international usually bleeds over one of the things that American Renaissance and I know I'm bringing up American Renaissance a lot simply because we're coming up on the date and it is going to be a big thing here in the state, but and and they are probably if anything the most effective white supremacist group out there um, supremacist collection for what that's worth, um, but yeah we they will bring a lot of folks from around the world to um, speak at their conferences. So yeah, it, it's important that we know who's who and what's what around the world. Um, we're definitely focused on what goes on in Russia. Russia is a, and the Ukraine thing is a, is one of those situations where you just basically have to stand back. Because there's no, there's no good guys in it. Putin's not a good guy. The Ukrainian rebels are not good guys. Um, they're, they're in a mess right now. And only thing you can do is because Russia, um, since since the fall of the Soviet Union, went batshit insane, and now you have an Antifa there gets ki get killed. I mean, it's just there is going to have to be another approach if we care enough. There's going to have to be another approach to solve whatever's going on up there. This Golden Dawn in Greece, yeah. that one's going to be a little easier to handle because they've just been ticking everybody off. There is some chapters of Golden Dawn here, thinking that they can bring it to the United States, and uh, they haven't gotten too far with their plans. Um, and Golden Dawn is basically being targeted by the entire country now, so we may not have to worry about them. Um, there's also, you know, the um, EDL, English Defense League, in um, in the UK. We um, and you know, people like Pam Geller are, are all about them and. Uh, so this, there are, Japan has problems, but our main thing is the best way that we can diminish the right's ability to function is by knowledge, is by education, is by information. Because when people have that information, they can act on it. And when they act on it, they fall. A lot of, a lot of what we have seen I know a lot of people don't care too much for Obama, but a lot of what we've seen since he's become uh, president is basically right wingers doing their best Hail Marys in the world. The last bastion of the last thing that the right has a solid grip on, to go back to um, 
the earlier conversations, the last thing is the criminal justice system. Because we don't want to be a part of it. We can't, I mean, that every other aspect of life, every other facet of life, we have no problem getting into the system, getting involved in it. Religion, um, science, business, we have people on the left that do that. We have very, very few that want to be cops and justifiable, and that's understandable, that want to work um, as a judge or in the prison systems or whatever. So they have a lock on that. And that's one of the reasons why when Trayvon, um, when Zimmerman was acquitted, um, they cheered because that meant that they still had not only life, but it doesn't have to um, end with just, you have to be dressed in a blue uniform to take down some black child. I mean, it was um, one of the things that the, I told people, however, in a video, is that someone suggested uh, after the verdict that what, that's, what that will guarantee is that there will be more George Zimmermans. And I said, no, there will only be one, and that one will be shot, because we can stand our ground too. But it was still, a shot across the bow to let us know that this is where their biggest strength is, their greatest strength is, and we got to find a way to um, diminish that. Um, when a couple of weeks ago there was a lawyer who was going to become the head of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. And they went after him because um, he represented Lamia. And they won. They did not want him to represent the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice because they know he will do his job. And they know he will do his job because he did his job with Lamia. Now, MSNBC, the liberals in this country, will just defend this gentleman on the basis that Everybody has a right to um, representation in court. Why don't they say that he that he won for Mamiya? It was this it was this attorney that got him off death row, and that hit the right like a ton of bricks. I live in Philadelphia. They were fuming over that. They hated that. And then here he comes advancing himself. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Like I said, I know a lot of folks don't like Obama, but one thing about Obama is that he gets what he wants. This attorney is going to find himself a job within the administration sooner or yeah. later. They didn't beat him down completely. He's not going anywhere. Kind of like they did with the secretary of that. that one there's no, the of, there's no telling where he'll be, but he's going to be somewhere. Yeah. I mean, they might have just freed him up to become the next Supreme Court justice for all they know. Right. <laughs> so let's just be real about it. Um, but it's the kind of thing that says they were more, it shows you exactly how afraid of losing their grip on that criminal justice system that they are. And I remember just hearing all the uh, things that were going on on the right after the Zimmerman verdict went down. In Philly, uh, there was a guy who wanted to, uh, there's a radio show host named Dom Giordano who wanted to talk about American exceptionalism and marry it to the Trayvon Martin case. So he brought on a guy who wrote a book about American exceptionalism named Charles Murray, yeah. who also wrote The Bell Curve. So he wanted to talk about American exceptionalism with a guy who believes that blacks and Hispanics are genetically the exception to that. And then Rush Limbaugh came on a couple hours later and he wanted to smear Trayvon by reading an article written by a white supremacist. And he didn't say it was a white supremacist, but it was a guy out of Maryland that everybody knows. I mean, it's, it's the kind of garbage that, that um, says that we need to focus on our criminal justice system and what is, um, what is investing it right now. And we have to figure out a way to um, take it down, take it at least at the very, at the, uh, at, at the very least, take it down to the point that they cannot just wantonly shoot our brothers and sisters in the streets and, and, and our white brothers and sisters in the streets um, as they are doing now. Without, and we, I'll, t I'll tell you about Jared Taylor like this. He's, he's a good friend of Pat Buchanan's, that's one thing. 
<laughs> Very good friend of that again. Um, but I would, but and that brings me to the um, to what you need to know about this particular crowd. There was a cluster of white supremacists in the D.C. area. He's one of them, and basically they all revolve around Pat Buchanan. And if you think Pat Buchanan is bad, these folks are worse because they're under the radar. You have one guy whose website is VDARE. His name is Peter Brimlow. I see him at CPAC all the time. Yes, I go to CPAC a lot. Because um, CPAC, for those who don't know, is called is the Conservative Political Action Conference. It happens every, um, every year in DC. And it's basically just some um, right-wing politicians and activists getting together to try to pitch whatever activism they're doing. And I find the white supremacists there all the time. And I find the, this particular crowd there all the time. Um, in, relate, in regards to the kind of connections that Taylor has, um, he was there at CPAC this year. And he spoke. Another group called the National Policy Institute hosted a side conference where you, could, where you needed a CPAC badge to get in. Yeah where he was the keynote speaker. It was, it was there for a day, and they wouldn't let anybody in, and they didn't record anything, didn't take any pictures, so you can be free. And, <laughs> and that'd give you an idea what, and they want, and they didn't go to the left forum. They didn't go to any of our conferences to find people. They, want, they go to CPAC to find people. So for all we know, there were some congressmen in that room. Yes. How do you get in? How do how did how did you get into the um, CPAC? Yeah. Um. This time I paid. And they let you in. Well, this is the other thing about right wing conservative, but especially in the mainstream. If you're black and you're among them, they will kiss your ass. I mean, they really will. I mean, they. I, I went to one of the big Tea Party rallies. Yeah, but they know who you are. They no, not all of them. Not all of them. The, um, the Nazis do, but the mainstream right wingers, all they see is a black person, and they get and they get called out on their racism so much that they have to they have to find any way to um, look like that. Oh yeah, they want they want pictures with me. They want me to meet their family. I mean I mean I have actually had all this happen to me every time I go every time I go to a room full of right wingers. One time I infiltrated an anti-abortion conference in Columbus, Ohio.